Well, you may be seated. Give the Lord a clap praise this morning. What an incredible time. Boy, I like that song, that Graves in the Garden songs. Come on and sanctuary. Thank you, Sarah, for a sweet time of worship. Thank you, worship team, band. Thank you for all that you do for the kingdom of God. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs, I want us to look at chapter 5 this morning. Proverbs chapter 5, verses uh, 1 through 12. But also, if you will, earmark Genesis chapter 3. And if you want to just put a place marker there, I'm going to be making reference to that in parallel with Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1 through 12. So again, Proverbs chapter 5, verse 1 through 12, as we continue on in our sermon series entitled, Exploring the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, we are on a journey. We've been on a journey. We're continuing on a journey. And the objective of that journey, if you will, is to explore on earth, if you will, the, 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 the nothing else but the infallible, inerrant, inspired Word of God. It's not known as God's Word. It's known as the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, it is the truth. And when we know the truth, it will set us free. But here's what I want you to understand uh, when it comes to exploring the Bible. Are you listening to me? When it comes to exploring the Bible, there's something very unique that happens. I want to warn you, if you've never been on this journey before, if you've never really begun to unearth the treasure that lies behind the Word of God, that living and breathing I want you to know and understand there's something incredible and unique that happens when you start reading the Bible. When you start reading the Bible, the writer of Hebrews says it like this, that the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to pierce as far as the vision of soul and spirit, of both joint and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. You know what that means? Listen to me. What that means is when you go exploring the Bible, the Bible starts exploring you. I said, when you explore the Bible, the Bible begins to make exploration of your life, literally finding you where you are in order to take you where God desires for you to be. Proverbs chapter 5 this morning, verses 1 through 12. As we continue exploring the book of Proverbs in this sermon that I want uh, to give thought to for just a few minutes, entitled, In Avoiding the Pitfalls. Avoiding the Pitfalls. The pitfalls. Now, while you're turning to Proverbs uh, chapter 5, you know, I, I was thinking about even the title of this sermon. When you, th when you think about the title of this sermon, in my mind, it just takes me back to yesteryear. You know, I've just been reflecting. I think that's what happens when you get a little older. I don't know, as I climb there, you know, it just seemed to be reflecting the yesteryear. Doesn't it seem like, I, I mean, my mind goes back to a simpler time. Come on, you know it, like when we used to walk to school five miles uphill both ways, snow, you know, I mean, snow year-round back then, you know, because we didn't have global warming, you know, back, back then, so it was just, did I say that? I mean, because usually what's here just comes, but here, here, you know, a much simpler time. Now, I'm just thinking about, just reflecting back, even in my childhood, James, and it wasn't that long ago, y'all, it, it just, hey, and, and, and think about how much... I don't know, things were different, you know, summers were actually summers back then, you know, not only by temperature, but by school year, you know, when we, we'd start late, late, late August, or even even wait till after Labor Day, yeah, I mean, y'all remember those, uh, wait a minute, <laughs> history may be repeating itself, I don't know, we just can't seem to figure out when school's going to start, hey, when I was a student, that, did, that would not have mattered to me, all right, but as a parent, it does, you know, but I'm just saying, I mean, we got all this, but, but here's, here's the reality. I was thinking about yesteryear, way back. Actually, my mind went all the way back to Christmas of 1980. Whoa, come on. Boy, the 80s now, that was a good decade. We had good music back then, too, you know. I'm just saying. I'm having a good time this morning. Just a bit of nostalgia going on in my mind. But Christmas of 1980, boy, what a... Christmas. I mean, a Christmas to remember. And that, I remember that year as I was a young child, you know, and that year we got a family gift. I think this is why I don't like family gifts at Christmas, you know. I mean, I'm just, maybe, hey, maybe I need counseling. I mean, y'all are helping me go way back. But I mean, seriously, I mean, 
Christmas of 1980, and we unwrapped that beautiful box, and there it was, one of those brand new, newfangled inventions, you know, newfangled things, and there it was. On the front of it, it said Atari 2600. Does anybody remember that? Come on, y'all as old as I am. You know, I mean, but that Atari 2600, what beautiful graphics it had on that thing, you know, joysticks and paddles, you know. And, and that's when video games were video games. Y'all get me? That's when video games were video games. We wasn't shooting people in the video games. We were shooting those invaders from space <laughs> and playing Pong. Beep, beep. But I mean, as I was thinking about uh, the title of this sermon, I, I couldn't help but think about that wonderful game. And the title of that game, it was one of the most popular games of that time, one of my favorite games. And the title of that game was Pitfall. Do y'all remember that? I mean, you see it. I mean, in those, look at that. Yeah, such beautiful graphics, okay. All the young people going, y'all play that? But I mean pitfall, and the object was you had to go through 24 levels in order to achieve victory, and you didn't even win anything, but achieve victory. And all through those levels, in order to uh, make it to the next level, in order to make it to the next screen, you had to avoid all of the obstacles that were being hurled your way. I mean, you had to make it past the tar pits. You had to make it across the crocodile's head. You had to make it across the fallen log. You had to go down, make it past the scorpions. I mean, all of this. I mean, it was just wrapped up in this bundle of joy known as pitfall. But when I was thinking about that, thinking about the game, thinking about this sermon, thinking about the Word of God, thinking about how it all coincides, you know, I was thinking that game of pitfall is a lot like the game of life. In order to achieve victory, in order to make it to the next level of our journey, in order to make it a long life's journey, we've got to avoid the pitfalls. And I want you to understand there are a lot of pitfalls that come our way. They may not be rolling logs and crocodiles that you got to step on. But friend, I want you to know there are a lot of pitfalls that are hurled our way. And if we're going to be uh, 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 successful in that, if we're going to make it to the next level, we got to avoid those pitfalls. I want you to know that those pitfalls come from the one who's hurling them at us is the one known as our enemy. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible is clear about who our enemy is as, a, as God's people and really as all people. He's against all humanity and his name is the devil. Your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. I want you to understand he's on a quest to get as many pitfalls before you so he can devour you, so he can destroy you, so he can disrupt your life, destruct your life, destroy your life. This is who he is. And it's unfortunate. The unfortunate reality, these pitfalls that he lays before us that so want to seek out to destroy our lives, we fall for them all the time. Friends, listen to me. If we're going to avoid, if we're going to avoid destruction and calamity in our life, then we've got to avoid the pitfalls. But the question becomes, how do you do that? And you know what I'm thankful for? Look at me. You know what I'm thankful for? The Word of God. You know why I'm thankful for the Word of God? Not specifically the book of Proverbs, because it's a book of wisdom. And when you got wisdom, you can begin to navigate around the enemy. As a matter of fact, you can begin to circumvent around the enemy. When we get to chapter 5, not only do we get a leg up on, on all of that in terms of, of circumventing the enemy, we get the inside scoop of what's going on. I believe the great, look at me, I believe the greatest way we can avoid the pitfalls is to know what they look like. Hey, I believe, I believe the greatest way we can avoid the pitfalls of life is to know what they look like and really how they operate in terms of seeking out how to destroy our life. Today, in Proverbs chapter 5, we get a sneak peek. We get a glimpse of that. Solomon unfolds for us a little glimpse of some characteristics of these pitfalls. And I think if we can identify them, it's much easier to avoid them and move on to victory. Proverbs chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, going down to verse 12. Stand, if you would, in honor of the reading of the Word of God. 
And as we look at this passage this morning, I'm going to give you three characteristics, outlining three characteristics of the pitfalls that seek to destroy our lives. Again, I believe if we can identify them by their characteristics, if we know how they operate, then we've got a better chance of avoiding them. Look what Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. My son, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may observe discretion and that your lips may reserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey. Ooh, and smoother than all is her speech. Mm. But in the end, she's as bitter as wormwood. Sharp as a two-edged sword, which means it'll cut you from the inside out. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold of Sheol. She does not even know how to ponder the path of life. You get caught up in all of this right here, you won't even be able to think straight. Her ways are unstable and she does not even know it. Now then, my sons, listen to me and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Keep your way far away. Keep your way far from her and do not go near to the door of her house. You know the best way to avoid sin? Don't get near it. (laughs) Or you'll give vigor to others and your years to the cruel one. Strangers will be filled with your strength and the hard-earned goods will go to the house of a stranger, of an alien. You'll groan at your final end. And when your flesh and your body are consumed and you say, Oh, how I've hated instruction and my heart spurned reproof. Father, give us a little time in your word this morning. And Father, in this time, Lord, I pray that you just take your word and do what you promised that you would do. That it would not go out in vain. It would not not accomplish what you set it forth to do. And I pray that you bring us to repentance today. Father, oh, how we've compromised. How we've compromised with the world and made a deal with the devil. If we can hang on to our jobs and have a little something in the bank. We'll just, we'll just go along status quo. It's time that your people who are called by your name humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, seek in your face. That's when you hear from heaven. And that's when you start healing some land. Father, we need some land healing today. But it's going to start right here in this church. If you, it, Lord, if we want the land healed, then we're going to have to start doing. Judgment starts at the house of God. So God, I pray that you'd speak clearly today. And God, I pray that in this, wherever we've hit a pitfall, pick us up, dust us off, and put us back in. We're ready to play. Different round, too. And then God, strengthen our mind and heart so that we can avoid the pitfall. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Three characteristics of the pitfalls that destroy our lives. The first characteristic of the pitfalls that seek to destroy our lives is the fact that these pitfalls, listen, we're identifying them. These pitfalls are skillfully seductive. Skillfully seductive. Look at verse 1. My son, Solomon says, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to my understanding that you may observe discretion and your lips may reserve knowledge. For the lips of an adulteress drip honey. Now I want you to know first and foremost as we look at this passage, there's no doubt 
that uh, Solomon is honing in on a specific pitfall, one of the greatest, and I don't mean this in, in terms of goodness, I mean this in terms of magnitude, but one of the, well, one of the greatest pitfalls of mankind, and it deals with sexuality. It deals with sexual sin. Paul, I mean, uh, Solomon is talking about here in this, he, he's talking about sexual and identifying sexual immorality. And I think it's important this morning that we look at that because I believe that this is a topic that somehow, some way has eluded our grasp and eluded our minds, especially in the church. I mean, when we think about what Solomon is talking about here, it's so important for our lives that we know and hone in on where we are. Somewhere we've gotten off beat here. I know what some of you are saying. Boy, is he going to talk about sex this morning? Hey, I can't think of a better place to talk about it. Can you? Hey, the world's out here telling sexual lies. About time somebody tells the sexual truth. This is the problem with us. We, we, we somehow bolstered our way up into a, a, an art of compromise and just an art of tolerance when it comes to this issue. I mean, everything, and, and, and how do we get here? And the reality is, when you think about it, every day of our lives we're bombarded with, with, with the idea of sexual immorality. Everything coming out of Hollywood, Holly Weird as I like to call it, everything coming down the pipeline, every time you turn on the TV, every movie you got, uh, that, that you go to, everything that you watch and see is about sex. Because sex sells. But the problem is, sex destroys also because it's destroyed the fabric and the mind. Listen, this is what's happened to the church. This is what's happening to our communities. This is what's happening to the whole doggone world. This is why the abortion clinics are overflowing and the churches are empty. This is why there's more people headed to the courthouse to get a divorce than headed to the church house to get some healing and help for the marriage. Because we've got this idea we just compromise with the world in this area right here. I mean, you think about it. Even amongst God's people. And I know what you're thinking, Pastor. Now, we're pretty good on this subject right here. We're pretty good right here. We take a hard stand as Southern Baptists. That's what we, we take a hard stand as Southern Baptists when it comes to this area. And we think, ladies and gentlemen, because when we're talking about sexual immorality, here's what we're talking about. We're talking about adultery. We're talking about stepping outside the confines of the marriage vow. We're talking about uh, fornication. Hey, that's having sex before you get married and any type of sexual activity. Don't be trying to justify something. Come on. That's sex before we get married. I mean, we're talking about pornography. We're talking about, hey, we're, we're talking about homosexuality. And see, that's the thing. We can get on this last one right here and we say, well, Pastor, we're pretty good on that as Southern Baptists. We think because we take a hard stand on one out of the four, hey, we think because we take a hard stand, Pastor, we're just not going to allow that inside the church. And listen, but here's my problem. Here's my problem. We might take a hard stand on homosexuality. Homosexuality. Well, when's the last time we took issue with any of the other? When's the last time we took issue with the people of God out here having marital affairs, out here just sleeping with anything and everything that they want to sleep with? When's the last time we took a hard stance on, on fornication? When's the last time? Listen, we're out here celebrating babies being born out of wedlock. We're celebrating everything. Out of here, most of the men in the church addicted to pornography and half the women. But we don't have issue with that. We got the church. I mean, here we are. We, we, we won't let them uh, redefine the, what, what marriage is, the definition of marriage, because marriage is between a man and a woman in the covenant confines of the, uh, of the boundaries of matrimony. Nobody's going to defute that, but we're trying to redefine marriage by everybody shacking up. Like, that's okay. Well, my, hey, I was married and I had somebody tell me I was married in the eyes of God. Friend, you can be married in the eyes of God, but he also said, render unto Caesar what Caesar. If you ain't got a certificate of marriage from the state, you're not married.
About time somebody started telling the truth and helping us understand where we are and what the problem is. We want to know what's going on. Why? We find it right here. One of the primary misfunctions of our life right here in understanding what Solomon is talking about. But here's the reality. No doubt Solomon's honing in on a specific type of sin. But you know the reality, the principle of what he's talking about? It can apply to any old sin. I want you to know that any old sin is just as equally destructive. All the sin, these pitfalls that come, our life is going to lead us to destruction. So I think that we can take the principle and apply it across the board to anything that's going to come in between us and God. Because it's all destructive. And listen to me, you know why it's destructive? Because it begins by being so seductive. It's destructive because it's so seductive. This is how it all works. See, I'm glad you came this morning. I'm glad you're tuning in this morning. You know why? Because we're going to be able to avoid some of these pitfalls because we can see exactly how the enemy's playing. You do realize that nothing's changed. Hey, you do realize nothing's changed, right? Y'all do realize that Solomon wrote this 3,000 years ago, but you know 6,221 years ago is the same plan, same plan of destruction. And you know the problem, Mr. Lair? We still falling for it today. He's not changed the plan. Satan has not changed his M.O. You know why? He don't have to. We're still as stupid today as we was back in the Garden of Eden. We still as dumb. We over and over. And it's not like we fall for it sometime. We fall for it all the time. It's just equally destructive and destroying in our lives because we never avoid the pitfalls. Hmm. But we can apply it. It's just so seductive. Can I tell you, you want me to tell you something about sin? This is what we're talking about. If you want to know what pitfalls are at sin, I know I didn't define that in the beginning. I figured you'd pick up on it somewhere along the way. You know what? Can you want me to tell you something about sin? Brother Bob, close your ears on this. I don't want you to hear this. But sin is sexy, ain't it? Hey, it is. If sin wasn't fun, we wouldn't want to do it. <laughs> Even the writer of Hebrews says that sin is pleasurable for a season. I'll get to that season in just a minute. But it's so, it's so, it looks so attractive, doesn't it? I mean, this is how it all began. This is how the enemy had it from the get-go. I mean, straight up from, hey, look, go over that earmarked in Genesis chapter 3. I want to show you exactly what Solomon's talking about and what he's trying to warn us from, from exactly what happened that got us in all this mess to begin with. Genesis chapter 3. We want to talk about how skillfully seductive that these pitfalls are. This is how we're going to avoid them, by knowing how they operate. Hey, listen, Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10, but I want to show you something right here. You ready? You ready? Anybody ready? You want to know how this thing works? Hey, do you want to avoid the pitfalls? Then let's go back and see what they look like right here. It doesn't change. It's going to happen again today. Same seductiveness. Same, it's going to draw you in. And the famous words, old Eddie from vacation. It's going to draw you in like flies on a rib roast. It's so seductive. Look here. Look what happened. Way back in the beginning. You know where this starts, right? Right after creation, all right, God crowned you of His creation. Adam and Eve, He took them and placed them in the garden. And there they're in the garden of Eden. God gave them a beautiful place, a perfect place to live. And here's what He told them. I'm going to give you this. He told them, He said, listen, Adam, all of this is yours. All of this, if this makes you feel better, if this makes you get it a little bit, all this is Ewan's. Young, Ewan's can have... That, that help you? That's Hebrew. All this is y'all's. Y'all can have all the trees here. I'm not going to bring you the food. That's a whole nother sermon. God said, I planted it all. I provided it all. But here's what you got to do. You got to go get it yourself. <laughs> Somebody ought to tell these people pulling statues down that that ain't the Word of God. <laughs> 
We ain't nobody going to bring it for you. You got to go get it. But here's the deal. He says, I'm not going, I got it all right here out here for you. You go and gather. He placed them in the garden to cultivate it and to keep it. And there he said, you can have the fruit of all these trees. Go back and read this in Genesis chapter 2. You can have the fruit of all these trees out here. Just don't eat from this one. Not, not this one. It's an illustration. But just don't eat. You can have all, th- just not this one. He placed that in there. I don't have time to get on my diatribe against Calvinism, but he placed that in there so we'd have some free choice. Because if there is no choice, you don't have a choice. Some people I ask today, why does evil, if God is so good, why does evil still exist in the world? Friend, if there wasn't something to choose from, you wouldn't have a choice. I don't know. I've got like 12 sermons going on in my head. Them fireworks boogered me up last night. But here's the, this is what happened. Now, now the enemy, this old serpent of old, our adversary, you know what? He's the same plan. He slips in the garden. And guess what happened? Everything changed. Look right here. This is how it all happened. And this is how it'll happen tomorrow. This is why you need to write it down. Look here, look here. Now the serpent. Mm. Serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman. See, this is where she got messed up because when the snake started talking to me, I'd have got out of there. Somebody ought to say amen. When he said to the woman, Indeed, let, let, let me read it how you should read it. You ready? Y'all don't read the Bible right. Eve. Hey. Eve, can I ask you a question? Has, Has God really said... You shall not eat from any of any of the trees of the garden. You mean to tell me you got all these trees out here and you can't eat from any of it? Then Eve said to the serpent, Oh no, no, no. From the fruit of the trees which are in the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat from it. Or, or touch it. I'm going to go ahead and give you a hint. That's not in Genesis chapter 2 verse 20. He didn't say anything about touching it. He just said eat. You shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Then Satan said to the woman, Aha! Sh- Eve. Come on. You know you're not going to die. You're one of God's favorites. Out of all creation. See, He'll tell you the truth in order to feed you a lie. He'll take that truth and manipulate it. Look here and say, You know you're one of God's favorites. Out of all creation. Out of all... That's how he walked. Serpent. Out of all creation. Everything, even including me. I was once a beautiful angel, and he created me. But you know what, Eve? You're more important than I am. In the whole grand scheme uh, of things in terms, you are the crown jewel of his creation. And you think he's really going to kill you? Come on! I'm doing the best devil I got. I don't know what to, I mean. But this is what happened. Are y'all listening? This is what happened. It happens every day of our life. Not just with Eve. It started with Eve and Adam. Adam responsible for his family. That's why the Bible says through one man, sin entered into the world. You know why? Because he is the head of the household, was accountable and responsible for his wife's decisions. Won't you let that soak in, man? Mm. Look here. You surely will not die. 
For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open. He's telling the truth. Because the Bible says once they took it, their eyes were open. He's telling them the truth. God had their eyes closed to all of this mess. But they broke the supernatural covering. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God. And you'll know good and evil. He was exactly right. He'll tell you the truth in order to manipulate you. Look here in verse 6. When the, wo when the woman saw, <laughs> when she saw that sexy tree. So I just read that, didn't there? When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, she ate it. You know what happened? Let me stop right there. You know what happened? She got seduced. This is how it all works in the beginning. This is what Solomon's garden, his son's about and speaking to us today. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is how it happens today. Just like, and this is exactly the plan of the enemy. How many times? We don't know definitively, we just know it. We can deduce from the passage of Scripture that God had placed Adam and Eve in the garden, had shown them the tree, they had begun their life, He had already gone out and said, be fruitful and multiply, which is one of my favorite commands, alright? But He says, go and hear. I mean, they're living life in the garden. We don't know how long they were in the garden before the serpent got in there and started messing all things up, but it was a period of time. And this wasn't the first time that she saw the tree. It's implied in that passage of Scripture. This is not the first time, but this is the first time she saw it. This is the first time she saw it like she saw it. Oh, this is how it works. The enemy, he'll begin to manipulate. He'll begin to work on us. And he'll make the things that are forbidden to us by Almighty God, by our protection, he'll make, he'll make those things look so appetizing that we just can't wait to take a bite. Because they just look so good. This is, if we're going to avoid the pitfalls, you know what we got to do? Understand how they begin to unfold in our life. You know what sin begins with? Hey, look at me. You know what sin begins with? Right here. Right here. If you want to protect yourself in the pitfalls, won't you protect yourself from what you watch and see? Get over here. Right here is a lamp unto the body. Hey, listen. Whatever it's going to do, illuminate. Illuminate right here. We've got to protect all this going on right here. Because it's so seductive. Again, I'll go back and tell you. If sin wasn't attractive, we wouldn't want to do it. So this is why we got to protect. Because He'll make even the things, He'll make even good things. He'll begin to spin them in a different light so He can twist it all up. And even give you what God has given for your benefit, He'll take and use for your own destruction. It is a mess. But you know what it begins with? Seduction. The pitfalls of this life begin by being skillfully seductive. But a second characteristic I want to share with you. Second characteristic of the pitfalls that seek to destroy our life is the fact that these pitfalls are massively misleading. Massively misleading. Look here. For the lips, verse 3. For the lips of an adulterous strip honey. Again, he's talking about sexual immorality, but we can put this all across the board. All sin drips like honey. But look here. And smoother than oil is her speech. Not only is Solomon talking about the premise of sin being attractive, but we also have to understand how deceptive and misleading it is. You know what sin will do? Sin will promise you all kinds of stuff that it cannot deliver. Hey! I said it will promise you all kinds of stuff that it cannot deliver. I mean, they'll make it look all attractive, and it makes it look all promising. But I promise you, it cannot deliver. It's deceitful. It's a ruse. It's a trap for your life. It's a pitfall that's wanting to destroy our life. Listen, when you hang out with the enemy, I want you to know, it doesn't, he wants to do nothing but destroy your life. And he will lure you in and then give you a false set of promises. 
It's the same as Solomon's talking about, even as it was way back in Adam and Eve. How it all began. Go back over there to chapter 3. I'll show you. You want me to show you how it works in deception? You want me to show you how it worked with Eve? I feel like if we can uncover it today, we might have a chance of avoiding it. We might have a chance of getting some victory in our life. Look here. I'm going to go back. I'll read the whole thing again. You ready? Now the serpent, more crafty than any beast of the field. This is what Solomon is trying to protect us on. Serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God has made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any of the trees of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, Oh, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God said, You can't eat from it, and you can't touch it, or you will die. And the serpent said, Surely, surely you're not going to die, Eve. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be open. And then you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. You want to know how this deception works? I mean, it works. it's like I already told you. He's going to take a bit of the truth. This is how Satan works. He's going to take a bit of the truth and begin to manipulate it in, in order to, to suck you in. You know what happens first? Exactly what happened here. So I'm going to give you some tidbits right here. Unfolding this, I hope you got your pen and paper out. Because you want to know what's going to happen? Because it's going to happen to somebody today. It's going to happen to somebody today. I'll be honest with you, it's already happened to somebody this morning. You might as well write it down. If you care about living a victorious life. Listen, if you like this big ball of stuff that you're rolling in every day, then don't listen to what the Word of God is saying. But if you want to do something different, write it down. You know what happens in the Word of God? Right here, same thing happened to Eve. If we're going to avoid the pitfall, you've got to know how it works. And he'll begin, oh, say, this deception, massively misleading. That's what pitfalls are. And here's what he does. Here's what he does. All right? He told Eve. Remember, he rolled up on Eve and said, Oh. Now, if you go back and look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 20, and the command that God gave Adam, which obviously Adam has communicated to his wife. Are you with me? Anybody with me? I'm almost done. I ain't got another 45 minutes to go. I'm almost, almost done. We're all for a week. I'm not going to get to see you for a week till next Sunday. I'm going to get a lot in today. I feel like you need it for some reason. I don't know. I don't know. All right, here. So we got Eve, right? Serving old crafty serpent got up in there. And here, if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, he said, here's what he said. Adam, all of this garden is yours. Y'all can have it, cultivate it, keep it. The fruit of the trees, all yours. Okay? All you want. All you want to go gather and get for yourself. You can have it. But just don't eat from this tree here. Now look how Satan says it. You want to know how Satan says it? Oh, you mean you can't have any fruit of any of the trees? You say, Come on, let me do that again. God said you can have all the trees, just don't eat this one. Just don't eat from this one. You know what Satan said? You mean you can't have any of the fruit of these trees? You see the difference? You see the difference? I said, he'll get you focused on the negative rather than the positive. This is how he gets you. He, I mean, it'll begin to look so sexy. It don't matter what sin is. I mean, gossip, whatever it is. You can apply it to here. You know how gossip looks sexy. And you know what happened? You know how it all gets started? You get focused on the negative rather than the positive. <laughs> Amen, preacher. I always just draw you in, then you get focused on the negative. Because here's what he'll do. He'll say, you mean you can't have any of the trees? And he, you know, it just got in her mind. And look what happened to her. You know how she responded? She responded with a lie. Because she said, oh, no, no, no. God said we can have the fruit of the trees, okay? Just the one in the middle, we can't eat from it. And guess what else he added? Or touch it. Go back and look and see if that's in there. That wasn't a command. He didn't say nothing about touching it. He just said you can't eat from it. Ooh, this you see, she's already messed up in her mind. 
I mean, Satan just slithered up right there. Just, well, walked up, all right? But he just got up and just got up in the middle of the garden, and then it just gets up in the middle of her mindset. She's already messed up. She just got focused on the wrong thing. You mean you can't eat from any of the trees? Oh, no, we can eat from all of them, just not this one. If we touch it, we're going to die. I just can't believe him. This is how the conversation is going. We're talking about this is Adam and Eve. Personal walk and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ in the garden. And you got the enemy. He'll have you focused on the negative rather than the positive. You get over there on that negative. Hey, negativity will bring you down. Negativity will bring you down. You know what you ought to do when you uh, uh, get around some negativity? Leave. You ought to make like a tree and leave. I heard that somewhere. I can't take credit, but it just fit right there, Danny. It just fit. But I mean, you get around that negativity and all that stuff because all that you see comes from the enemy. Negativity comes from the enemy. He'll deceive you. You know what else? Look what else can deceive you. He'll deceive you by making things seem so restrictive and negative, you know. Get to messing with your mind. But you know what else he'll do? And this is where it gets you. Y'all ready for this? Get your pens out. Because this is what's going to happen. Once he gets your mind all messed up on the negativity, then he'll get you, he'll get you with the authority of the Word of God. He'll have you doubting the authority of the Word of God. He'll have you doubting God. He'll have you so messed up in your mind and your heart that you'll begin to doubt what God's Word says and that it's actually true. You know what he said? Now, you know what he said? Satan said, You mean you can't have any of these trees out here? And Eve set him straight now, kind of. She said, No, we can have it. We just can't eat from this one. But if we touch it or eat from it, we're surely going to die. Oh. Oh. You, Eve. Come on. You're not. Surely you don't believe that. Surely you don't believe what God said that came out of his mouth. Now you know you're not going to die. Come on. You're the crown jewel. You think he's going, Eve, you are beautiful. He loves you more than anything in the whole part of creation. You know that, oh, Eve, you got so much to learn. About God. I don't know. I'm doing the best I got, you know. I mean, I don't know how the serpent walked. But here's what I'm saying. This is exactly, you know what he's doing? He will cause you to doubt the Word of God. He'll have you doubt the authority of the Word of God in your life. And he'll tell you lie after lie that, oh, it don't matter. This is what the problem is today. That we messed up on a bunch of lies and we don't believe and heed to the authority of the Word of God. Somebody along the line, the Satan came on in. Somebody along the line said, oh, don't you worry about it. I know it says in the Word of God, but you know God's all right with that. Friend, I want you to know He's not. If He says it, He means it. There's a reason why He put it all in here. And I promise you, it's not to restrict your life. It's to protect it. He knows what's best for your life. Now, Satan will tell you, oh, God don't know what He's talking about. God won't do that. Oh, you, surely you won't die. If God said it, He'll do it. If God said it, He'll do it. I know some of y'all think, well, I'm glad that's the Old Testament back there. Lord, just kill you if you do something. Hey, listen, I want you to know, won't you read John chapter 15, verse 1 through 8, where he said, I'm the vine, and you are the branches, and any branch that does not bear fruit, he'll take away. God's still in the judging business, friend. I'm just glad he operates in the confines of grace and mercy first, aren't you? He's a loving God, but he's still a just God. And you better heed to the Word of God all the way from Genesis to Maps because it's all true. It's 
the problem. We don't believe that. We don't believe that. We try to segment it. You know, the enemy will tell us, Brother Bob, that the Old Testament, well, don't worry about it. That's the Old Testament. That's the old fogey. You don't have to worry about that anymore. That's where we get messed up on all this stuff about tithing and stuff. Well, you know, tithing ain't in the New Testament. No, it's not. You know what Jesus said? Give it all. <laughs> oh, I like that Old Testament better, preacher. It's just good back there. But he'll lie to us about the Word of God. He lied to Eve. There was a penalty for our wrongdoing. But he led her to believe that it was not true. The same thing he did yesterday to you. The same thing. Same thing he did last week to you. Same thing he did last month. Hey, same thing he'll do tomorrow. It's the same plan. I'm just trying to unfold it for you this morning from the Word of God. Aren't you thankful for the Word of God? Because now we, got, we know exactly how the enemy operates. We don't have to guess and wonder. But if we're going to protect ourselves, and surely to goodness, look at me because I'm getting ready to close. Surely to goodness, you want victory in your life. Surely to goodness. Now, I'm not just talking about victory for your eternal life. That comes through Jesus. But victory in everyday living of your life. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm just saying that we can have an abundant life. You know why? Because Jesus said so. He said, I've come that you may have an abundant life. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I've come that you may have life and have it more abundant. But if we're going to have that abundant life, we're going to have to avoid the pitfalls. Third and final characteristic. See, we're unfolding them one by one so that you can begin to look how, see what they look like and how they operate so we can then identify and move away from them. Third and final characteristic of the pitfalls that seek to destroy our lives is the fact that these pitfalls are substantially surprising. Substantially surprising. Look at this, verse 3. For the lips of an adulterous drip honey... And, uh, and smoother than oil is their speech. Look at verse 4. But in the end, she's as bitter as wormwood. You go on down and read the rest of that. You know what happens? And I say this in closing. You know what happens? Here's what happens. You get all seductive. Get all lured in. Like flies to honey. And then deception. Because it's promised you all kind of stuff. Then you get in the midst of it. And as soon as you fall for it, you begin to see the reality. You know what happens? Surprise! It just wasn't what you thought. Look, she's a smooth talker. Just honey just dripping off the lips of an adulteress. This is sin captivating us, bringing us on in. And then guess what happens when you take the bite of the forbidden fruit? Surprise! Boy, just wasn't what you thought it was going to be. Have you ever been there before? Don't raise your hand. Have you ever been there before? Just doesn't look like you thought it was going to look, does it? That's what happened to Adam and Eve. You know what happened after verse 6? You ought to go back and study that passage. After verse 6 of Genesis chapter 3. The eyes. She saw that the food was good, the fruit was good, and then she ate it and gave some to her husband too. What a dumb dumb. Hey friend. Hey dad. I can't prove this theologically. In a sense, because it didn't happen. But here's the thing. Go back and think about this. What if Adam hadn't have taken that fruit? What if it was just Eve? Who did he hold accountable for taking it? What if it was just Eve? We might not be in this mess we're in today. This is how strong the leadership of our family, leading our families away from the very things that I'm talking about, the pitfalls that I'm talking about. But guess what happened? She saw that the fruit was good. And they took a bite. 
Boy, it looked so good. But in the end, it was bitter as wormwood. Surprise! Surprise! My mother like, surprise, surprise, surprise! <laughs> That's exactly what happened, y'all. This is what it was. The eyes were open, exactly what Satan said. The eyes were open, they knew they were naked, and guess what happened? When you get surprised, you know where it sends you? As far away from God as you can get. See, this is why we've got to avoid the pitfall, because you know the worst place you can be as far away from God as you can be. But that's exactly where Adam, what did Adam and Eve do? The Bible says they went and hid themselves. Oh, they heard the Lord walking in the, in the cool of the day. Adam! Adam, where? where? I'll give y'all a hint. He knew where he was. He's God. It's a rhetorical question. Because he knew what had happened. And let me tell you something about the God. Let me, let me tell you something about us and how all this works with the God that we serve. Now, I'm going to close with this. Come on. Think about this. Be ready because I'm getting ready to close. It's sin. When we get the pitfall, it will send us running as far away from God as we can get. And friend, that's the most lonely place that you can be. This is why I'm telling you today to heed the Word of God. Don't fall victim. Don't fall in the trap. Avoid the pitfalls. It will lead you to victory because you're never going to find victory apart from Christ in a relationship with Him and in fellowship with Him. This is why if you've never been saved, you need to get saved today. Give your heart and life to Jesus, to the gospel, and the fact that Jesus died by sin, according to Scripture. He was buried on the third day. God raised Him from the dead. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth to Jesus, Lord, believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's why you need to be in a relationship. Because you can't ever have victory apart from Jesus. Relationship or fellowship, right? But sin, it'll send us running so far from God. You know what happened? You want me to give you modern day what happened to Adam and Eve? Sin came in. They got involved, and the first thing that went was church. First thing that happened, move away from that quiet time if they ever had one. Probably didn't have a good one. That's how they got. Moved away from the Word of God. Boy, they got as far away from God and God's people as they could. You ever notice when you're in sin, you can't stand God's people? And you sure don't like the preacher. That's why I got to chase y'all around Walmart all the time. That's the first thing, Odell. I mean, y'all see the preacher, you'll be over at the dairy aisle. Next thing I know, you clear over the men's sporting goods. You're over at the men's shoes. I didn't even know they sold shoes till I hunted you down. What'll happen to send you running? And there you'll find yourself just lonely, hiding from God. Can I tell you something about God, though? Just like in the beginning, He works the same way today. You know who was coming after Adam and Eve? He knew where He was. <laughs> he was asking the question, Mr. Larry, but He knew where He was because our God comes looking for us. Come on. <laughs> you may run from God, but He run, He running to you, friend. <laughs> That's what he's done today. That's why you showed up at church today. Because the Holy Spirit came running after you. You know why? To change your life today. As some of you have been so messed up. Now don't let the enemy. Because as some of you watch it by way of broadcast day, I got up on them sexual sins, you know. And then, I mean, you, you've, been, you've, been, you've been snookered. You've been snookered, right? And now the, Satan got you. You ain't listening to anything else I said. You know why? You've been mad about what I said already. But I'm just a messenger. But you may, you're you going to take it out on the preacher. So I just, you know, that Brother Steve, he's just insensitive. He's just uncompassionate. He don't understand what I'm going through. No, I do. That's why I'm trying to help you.
that's trying to help you. The Word of God trying to set you free. You don't have to live like that. He don't want you to. He's coming at you. Friend, He sent me in hot pursuit of you with the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God. Come drag you back in the kingdom of heaven. Said, sin will send you running from God. Oh, that's the God that I sow. Mm. He did come running to you. He'll, he'll find you where you are. Next thing you know, there he is. What a welcome sight. Friend, that what you is that what you want? You want something different for your life? He's going to offer. See, He's given us a pass today. He's given us a ticket today to understand how this works. But it all starts and stops with God. And your trust and reliance on Him through His Word, through putting up these barriers that the enemy wants to throw when He's hurling these pitfalls at you. Oh, He's going to bring you, draw you in, tell you lies, and then surprise you. Surprise! Come on, friend. Come on today. Look at me, friend. You who are watching by way of broadcast. You know what he said? Come on home. See, he came looking for you today. He came looking for you today. Today. First day in the rest of your life. We might not have avoided the pitfalls. We know how now. He's ready to clean up the ones you've already fallen in. If you'll let him today. The Bible says, if we'll confess our sin, he's faithful and just. Forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Hey, you want some refreshment? You come get a little refreshment from church. You know what the Bible says? Repent and return. In order that your sins may be wiped away. And times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. Today's it, friend. What do you want to do now? Your choice. Father, help us. Know and understand what this means and what it looks like. Today, Father, you've spoken through your word. you revealed some powerful things for us. Now, we've got to figure out what we're going to do. With it. We're either going to say yes to what you're offering or no. There's no in-between. Teach us now. Move on us. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's stand to our feet.